Welcome to the University of Northampton Popular Music Podcast. Hi there, my name is Dr. Stace Constantino. I'm a senior lecturer and the program leader for popular music at the University of Northampton. This is the second podcast with award winning producer Gareth Jones. Gareth, you were so generous with your time and your spirit. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And for everyone at home listening, I hope you enjoy it. So I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to go back in time again. I know we've jumped around. It's all right. It's, a, it's a journey, yeah. right? It's a multimedia journey. Well, we, we can do that, right? We can jump wherever we want. Um, so, yeah, so we asked you about, you went, um, so you had, music was encouraged as a boy, and then you've, you've got a job at the BBC, you learnt some to do, to record, and then you went and became independent, and then you went to Germany. You left Blighty and went to Berlin. Yeah. So what inspired you to go to Germany and, and Berlin? Well, uh, what happened was I got hired to to uh, make a record with a German new wave band, Neue Welle, they called it, mm-hmm. called Ideal. And I'd already met, I think through Tuxedo Moon, I'd met the bass player who was called Ernst Deuker. He's a very nice man, mm. young man. Mm. And we were all young at the time. Mm. And he was interested in me working with Ideal on their second album. Um, but it didn't come together, and they made that with the legendary uh, Amer- uh, German producer, Connie Plank, who's an icon now, sadly died. Rest in peace, Connie. Um, and then we kind of vaguely stayed in touch. This is pre-internet. I don't know how the, we did this, but we vaguely stayed in touch. And I met the whole band uh, with a view to working on their third album. Mm-hmm. And I co-produced it with a great a German producer, musician called Mickey Moiser. But anyway, so I met the band. <clears throat> and so this was a gig I was hired to work on. They were all from Berlin. Mm-hmm. They wanted to record in Vienna. So this was amazing, you know, we went to Vienna, mm. um, we recorded in a recording studio there. Mickey Moiser was like the artist producer, and I was like the engineer producer on the team okay. at the time, because I was very much an engineer producer at that time. I wasn't playing music or okay. that aware of musical structures and so on. So so it came to mixing the record, and I was, uh, you know, as the engineer producer member of the team mm. that was down to me kind of to make a suggestion where to i was a bit insecure because i was a young i mean i've i was full of confidence and i knew everything in a way yeah. but i had i didn't have the security of saying well we can mix this anywhere yeah. uh, but so i wanted to go back to london to mix in a studio right. that i knew okay. i thought that made sense right? Yeah, right so the manager of the band uh called connie consec uh, said well that's fine you can do that if you want um but before we do that, just come and have a look at this studio in Berlin mm. that that we've got. Because I think it was more convenient for him to re- mix in Berlin. The band all lived in Berlin. Yeah. It was a bit easier. Made Basically made sense. I could mm. see. So I said, well, of course, yeah, I wasn't that keen on mixing somewhere I didn't know. But I said, of mm. course, I'll come and have a look. Mm. So he took me to the legendary Hansa Studios. Mm-hmm. And uh, they had a, like a penthouse mix suite, man. It was awesome mm. at the time. It's like a state of the art mixing suite and uh, it had a big solid state logic console in it Mm -hmm. and uh, i think it's still a bit of a thing for the young engineers to work on solid state logic but uh, certainly at the time in the early 80s it was this was the console every i'd never worked on a solid state board before so he took me into this penthouse mixing suite and i just walked in the door and i said all right straight away (laughs) you know because i was like i was overwhelmed by it was i mean i felt a spiritual connection i suppose as well but i was over i was enthused and enthralled mm. by the incredible facilities available there mm. and uh, so basically i said yes straight away mm. so that opened a relationship to the recording studio hansa studio where i did loads of work in the up and coming years um and uh, I, I i i mixed the record i hadn't didn't move to berlin already but i mixed the record there i i uh the um, the uh, singer and one of the main writers in Ideal 
uh, did another co-writing project and produced another record that she invited me to mix in the Hansa studio again. Mm. And I did that. That was became a huge hit in Austria and Germany. Mm. Um, I think when I was mixing that there, we had taken a break on uh, the recording of Construction Time again, the Depeche Mode record, the first Depeche Mode record I worked on, which we recorded round the corner in John Fox's studio. John Fox had built a studio. Mm. Uh, and so we were looking for somewhere to mix this record. <clears throat> and Daniel, the record company boss and producer at that time of Depeche Mode, was in Berlin with Nick Cave and the Birthday Party, who were recording downstairs in the big hall in Hansa studio. It's a big multi-room studio, massive place, amazing space, amazing vibe. And I said to him, look, come up and look at this mix room. Uh, you know, maybe we can mix construction time here. And he was also enthralled and enthused about it. He could see that it was an incredible facility. One of the things that was very important for us with Depeche Mode was to have a massive control room. Mm -hmm because we recorded everything in the control room. <clears throat> we didn't go in the live room at that time to set up. All the synths were in the control room. And, and, uh, and with Depeche, the recording was never finished until the mix was done. We always had synthesizers set up for last minute overdubs or new ideas or anything. So he totally got the vibe as well. And we went uh, and we mixed construction time there. In the meantime, I'd also fallen in love with someone who lived in Berlin. Mm. So I had this opportunity to work in this incredible studio and I had the opportunity to build on my developing love life as yeah. well. Yeah. So it's like love and music and work all came together okay. in one. It was an opportunity for me to move to Berlin and, and you know, tick both the Freudian boxes of love life and work life mm. in one and, and grow through both of them. So I moved to Berlin for 10 years and, and an amazing journey it was. And a really exciting time to be there, is that right? Yeah. It was like, wasn't expensive and you could do stuff there. Have I got that right? Yeah, you have, yeah. yeah. It was, uh, I mean, it was, you know, um, an isolated island of mm. capitalism in communist East Germany right, yeah. and, it, and it was amazing. It was an amazing vibe for a young mm. musician. There were lots of us there. There was... A, there was some kind of tax breaks for buying equipment because I was spending, which was, I didn't really know about at the time. No, no. That turned out to be a real bonus though, because yeah. as a young, young uh, producer, I was spending all my money on gear. Mm. You know, as yeah. you do, yeah. uh, I didn't have any family responsibilities. No. So and that turned out to be really positive, and the and the prices were really good for the English bands who came over to work, right. because the. You could come to Germany and stay in a hotel and work in a recording studio mm. for the same price as you could just work in a recording studio in London, roughly. Right. So it was a great vibe yeah. for people. People were really enjoying it. We had a great time. We made loads of great records there. And did you learn to speak German when you were there? I did, yeah. You did, yeah. yeah. I'd, uh, I'd, I'd done uh, GCSE, French and German, mm. and got quite good grades, but I... I but, I hadn't. I was too embarrassed to speak properly, mm -hmm. and and prior to that, I'd been. I'd done a, like a TV show as a sound engineer producer with Tuxedo Moon in Belgium, mm. and the none of the techs chose to speak English, right. and so I had to use my schoolboy French. Mm. And at that point, I lost my embarrassment about speaking a foreign language because I had to say mm -hmm. something mm. to to liaise, you know, and so. And, and and that knocked on to when I moved to Germany. I had like my German was a joke, mm -hmm. but to start with. But I worked with some musicians who didn't speak English, so I had to yeah. say something. Mm. So it grew from there. And now I love speaking German, and I, mm. you never mistake mistake me for a German because I got a, quite a thick English accent. Right. But I'm qu quite good. My German's pretty good. Yeah. And I still enjoy it speaking with. I go to. Switzerland or Austria or Germany. I love to speak German. So. And then what brought you back to the UK then? And oh, and this is start also talking about your your home here in this in this particular place. Well, I had a wonderful ten years in mm. in Berlin, mm. um, and then uh, I, I and uh, I 
uh, as a lot of young people do, I embarked and then on a new uh, relationship, actually, with a lady who's uh, now my wife of many oh, years. Okay. Right. And she had a uh, little... Um, she's in the music industry too. She had a PR company very much based in London. Right. And we started dating mm. and became f friends and, and lovers. And um, we decided... Uh, as the relationship, uh, you know, uh, matured, mm -hmm. we decided we'd like to live together, mm. uh, and it was a bit of a no-brainer. She couldn't, uh, her, she couldn't. If she'd moved to Berlin, her business would have shut down. Right. So, obviously, she had a career, and she didn't want to do that, and I didn't want her to do it. And anyway, we were enjoying both of us earning money in the music business in the eighties. It was quite a good time, mm. the late eighties, I suppose this was, mm. and so I. Th when we talked about living together it was a bit of a no-brainer that i would m move back to uh, london mm. and and i also felt creatively and artistically it'd be good for me because mm. in berlin at that time mm. <clears throat> it was just before the big techno electronic music explosion that came out of berlin mm. just at the start of that period i was quite a big producer mm. in a relatively small pond sure. and when i came back to london i was like one of hundreds of top producers yeah. so i th i felt it would be an encourage uh, just a new scene uh -huh. and an opportunity for, again and try to raise my and raise my game as well you yeah. know because mm -hmm. basically i was uh basically i was almost no one in london when i came back sure. so yeah. so that was kind of good for me mm. so <clears throat> and and it felt like my time i love berlin still to this day i'm sure berlin's been an awesome city for a thousand years you know yeah. obviously it had a bad period yeah. for about 20 years mm -hmm. it was a bit dodgy mm -hmm. very extraordinarily bad mm -hmm. with the rise of fascism mm -hmm. uh, and and populism mm -hmm. uh, which totally spiraled out of control and had really bad results as we know um and but anyway it's it, it, you know all these big cities are amazing hotbeds of creativity mm -hmm. so I love going back to Berlin, and I've done some work there since I left, and mm. it's it's a great city. But at that time, it felt, okay, this is a good time. The wall had come down. Everything changed in my personal life. It felt like a good time to make another move, you know. And I came back, and I, was, I had a lot of gear. I didn't really have a concept to make a little recording studio room. No. But I just had a lot of gear, and I didn't know what to do with it. So I thought, oh, I should get a little room in London. Mm. And I met Richard Boot at Strong Room, who's the, one of the owners of this legendary space. Mm. And he was just building these rooms on this side of the warehouse. It was all derelict warehouse. Mm. And I came, and it was a building site. And I said, oh, and I committed to taking a room. Mm. Really, because I had nowhere to put my equipment. I didn't yeah. have a concept no. or anything. I was just, I was just winging it. And so I built uh, a different incarnation of this room in the early 90s in here. In those days, I used to rent a 24-track tape recorder that we wheeled through the corridor and put in the corner there. Then I had a mixing desk at the front here, a little, quite a big Mackie mixing desk, actually. Yeah. I think I had 56 channels of Mackie and a 24-track wow, tape recorder. I had a 32.8 I had and a 24.8. Yeah. They coupled together as a one big mm. mixer. And I had a patch bay in the corner, and I just went nuts mm. making a, a little module. And, uh, and that was the move back to London. Yeah, mm. so I, and then I, I kind of set up here. And I didn't lose my European connections, of course. I was still yeah. able to work in Europe, yeah. thanks to the European Economic Community. Mm. I could work. This was the joy of being able to go to Berlin at the time. I could. Ju it was legal to work anywhere in Europe. That was. Yeah. A, that's amazing for artists, you know. Yeah. And unfortunately, that's something that populism in this country is now shut down for us mm. as artists. It's very hard for people to now go and work in Europe, unless you're a big successful band and you can do yeah. all the paperwork. Yeah. Now, obviously, at that time, I could just didn't matter. I could go and work anywhere, live and work anywhere in the community, mm. and and. I'm I'm very disappointed in us as a nation actually that we've mm. we've shut down that possibility for our young people mm. and our old people actually mm. we've shut it down for everyone yeah. and and uh, but at the time I could do it and I I was able to reap the benefit of that in the same way that I reap the benefit of a really good state education you know so mm. so yeah there you go I came back to London and 
set up here and embarked on a new adventure, new set of adventures, as you said. Can I ask you about your quad? Because you've you've gone into spatial sound, haven't you? Or surround, or quadraphonics, yeah. or octophonics. Quadraphonics. Quadraphonics. Um, Can I ask you about what inspired you to do that? I know you've already said sound is spatial for you, isn't it? I think you've already mentioned that. Yes. And but this I, is technically spatial then, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And there's so many things about it. I only ever did one live sound tour as a sound engineer, mm. and it's a, 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 with Tuxedo Moon back in the very early 80s, I think, mm -hmm. and I uh, produced a record for them, and they invited me to go and do the live sound for a little tour in Europe, and we did it in quad. I don't know how we did it, but somehow I said, that'd be great, let's do it in quad. And quad was like a format in the 70s, mm. so that's way back, and then I didn't work in quad now, as we know, immersive audio has become really big. Yeah. Uh, I've done a few little gigs, me and Daniel performing in our live modular with two sets of stereo outputs kind of naturally lends it to quad sure. as well because you can put yeah. two outputs in one in uh -huh. two speakers uh -huh. and two outputs in another two speakers. Uh -huh. And so we've done a little couple of few little quad gigs mm. and I've done some quad gigs as a solo performer as well and obviously Dolby Atmos has become a, like a big thing um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's kind of expensive and complicated to set up Very. and the way that I look mm. at quad I call it like punk Atmos mm, yeah. because most of my yeah. engineer and musician friends mm -hmm. if they can be asked yeah. can easily do quad because yeah. you only really need a audio interface with four outputs Definitely, instead of yeah. two, and yeah. loads of my friends have an interface with four outputs, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so you can then, <clears throat> and then you just buy buy another couple of speakers. Yeah. Or we, m many of my musician and m uh, producer friends, mm. uh, uh, younger colleagues, they've got two sets of speakers anyway. Yeah. So if you can be bothered to set it up, it's mm. pretty easy. Yeah. And I've what I've done in this room is I I. And another thing, I mean, I, I love so much about quad. One of the things I like about performing in quad mm. is it's, I don't, I mean, I don't want to get too political about it. And I don't, but, but, but if you're in the middle, you're immersed with the audience in a sound field. It's not, it's, it seems to me to be like a bit of a democratic format. Uh -huh. There's a, a sense in which when the, when the, performers are on the stage uh -huh, uh -huh. it's a bit almost i mean I, i've I really enjoyed loads of gigs with performers on stages yeah. it's a bit fascistic mm. there's a, like a there's like this the performers are declaiming from the stage mm. you know in the way that they had a bit of a revolution in theater in the 60s and 70s when they went in the round mm. and they said they destroyed the proscenium arch yeah. and in a way for me there's something really nice about playing, performing modular. I just played in Malta recently on the top of an old castle and we did that in quad and the audience and me were all in the sound field together. Mm. And, and, and the sound, e my vision of quad is each speaker's equally important. Right. It's not like there's two no. main speakers I and two that. speakers doing it at the back. No. I love the idea, mm. and I think it's probably an old idea that goes back to experimental electronic music labs in the 60s and 70s, mm. where, where, where quad was really a... It, it's democratic in the sense that each speaker is equally important, put it yeah. like that. Yeah. We don't have the main speakers at no. the front no. and, the you know, the Lord, the mm. Lord and the... The, the, mm. the oligarch speakers at the front and the peasant speakers at the back, no. we have all four speakers are equally important. Mm. And I just really like working in that sound field. Yeah. Um, and I had a bit of a breakthrough with this, uh -huh. an ongoing part of the journey. It's still Voyage of Discovery. And I'd love to play you a bit of quad after we've had a sandwich before you go, before if you've got time. Yeah. <laughs> um, but when we came to Northampton yeah. for the accreditation uh -huh. uh, with James... Uh, I had a really nice chat with Michael, yeah. who's, who's very involved in quad, I know, and interested in immersive audio at yeah. Northampton. Yeah. And he pointed out to me that because Dolby Atmos is a playback agnostic system, mm. you, 
you can play Atmos over quad. Mm. And and I thought, I was like, oh, yes, of course. I kind of knew that. Mm. But until Michael had said it, I hadn't taken it on board. No. So what that means is, mm -hmm. in this room, for instance, uh -huh. uh, I've got m Apple Music available on my computer. Yeah. Um, and if I set up a, a play, you know, it, on the Apple computers, you just tell it what, audio output you're playing to it's yeah. in audio midi setup it's pretty simple yeah. for a producer or a musician so if i tell it that my playback system mm. is what i call the the Genelec quad system yeah. which comes out of outputs 61 62 63 and 64 in my world could yeah. be any outputs you want yeah, yeah. but i tell it mm -hmm. that i'm playing to that mm. i stri i play apple music I don't need any extra software, any plugins or nothing. No. And it, it decodes Apple Atmos to quad. And it works. Immediately. Have, you, have you heard the latest Jean-Michel Jarre album? In, in Atmos? Special. No, I haven't yet. Oh, it's I will, really good. I'll yeah. check that out. Yeah, he's really good with it. I'm sure he is, yeah. yeah. And, and it's quite interesting. Some of the Atmos music they are using, a lot of Atmos... It's still like 5.1 used to be, if you remember that. It's still like the main speakers mm. and effects in the back. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But, mm. which I understand because it's very challenging. It's funny, this whole Atmos thing, man. Because it's not, if you're a music lover, mm. it's not that. I've done it at home. Mm. I've got these little speakers. See those little yeah. IK iLouds, they're called. Yeah. Little cheap speakers. They're really good. Mm. And I got a little Studio B in the back bedroom at home. I call it Studio yeah. B. Yeah. And I had two of those. Mm -hmm. And now I've got four of them. Because yeah. I've done it at home as well. It's pretty easy to set up. Uh -huh. um, and it's really amazing. Uh, so, so... Thanks to Michael for that. So uh, I, I've done the same thing. Some of the, a lot of the Atmos is, in my opinion, boring because mm -hmm. the back speakers have just basically got a few effects in it. Yeah, but some yeah. of it's really good. Some of it's really excellent. Uh, and and mm. that is inspiring. And mm. and and I've started uh, working on on productions and music in Atmos. Uh, not in Atmos. I've started working on my own productions and my own music in quad uh, and I found a couple of times where I've sent, if I'm collaborating with a, a friend and colleague, mm. I, if I just fold the quad down to stereo by just mixing them equally, yeah. it sounds like really good stereo. Right. Sometimes yeah. I've got monitor, yeah. I can tweak it in stereo, I've got a little button I can push on my monitor controller, mm -hmm. I can just hear the stereo. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I make a tiny adjustment, mm. a lot of the time it works in stereo straight away mm. Then it's really for the future, I'm hoping it's going to be really productive because it's very easy to turn the quad into Atmos. Yeah. I just ignore the height information or yeah. if I'm using an immersive audio plug-in, mm -hmm. that has a bit of height information in it anyway. Mm -hmm. So so I'm hoping to... So the thing for me about the quad is I, it's affordable, it's awesome, mm -hmm. and I can actually do it. It's that kind of, awesome. that's why I'm calling it, it's the new yeah. mono, you yeah. could say. <laughs> or I'm calling it yeah. Punk Atmos, yeah. you know. But it's incredibly exciting and and inspiring to actually create the music in quad. And I'm doing it with a few colleagues now, remotely, mm. where, they, where I've encouraged them to set up quad in their studio so we can write and compose and produce in quad already. Mm. So, and... It has the the bonus that we can quads a bit of a weird format. I could see you can sell it on Bandcamp. Okay. So if people are enthusiastic, mm. yeah, I, I I I've got some of my music's on Bandcamp in quad. Mm. Um, I did a, a gig at the Ship and Whale in in Bermondsey, mm. an electrogenetic gig that we recorded in quad. Thanks to the live sound engineer, he recorded it in quad. I performed in quad, we recorded it in quad, and I put it on Bandcamp in quad, but also you can turn it into Atmos that you can then give to the streaming giants. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, obviously they... Which is a good place to get your music if you want people to hear it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. doesn't really generate any of us any income unless we're big players, mm. but still it's nice to have the music on Apple Music and... Yeah. Spotify don't do Atmos yet, but I think Apple Music I does it. I believe it's coming for them. Tidal does it. Mm. Amazon Music do it. 
Mm. Apple Music do Apple it. Apple Music. You know, so, mm. so it's quite, it's very exciting to produce in quad mm. from the ground up because you start thinking spatially mm. and feeling spatially from very early on in the process. It's really wonderful. Mm. And, and it has the bonus that I can deliver to Atmos. Mm. I'm a, a bit disappointed because a lot of people's Atmos systems, they only have small speakers at the back. Mm. But still, we'll see how that goes. I can't, mm. I can't control what the music's going to be played back on. We couldn't do that with mono music. We couldn't do that with stereo music. No. We could never control. You know, I've been to loads of friends' houses mm. back in the day. You know, they'd have stereo, but there'd be one speaker over there and mm. one speaker behind the sofa. Yeah. You know, you yeah. can't control it. No. But no. you can only make what you feel is exciting mm. to make. Mm. Then, and I'm on the, I'm totally on the immersive audio bandwagon, and it's from no, loads of inspirations, and, and 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 Michael was one of the inspirations where I realised actually I can now listen to Atmos at home. I like it with speakers behind me. Yeah. Uh, the soundbar Atmos I find a, it's okay, but it's a bit boring for me. Mm. I want to have no. speakers all I think around you need me. It behind you to, I think really. you do. It's a real world. It's, it's kind of um, enhanced stereo, really. Is it? It's done in front of you. Yeah, I think so. Mm. And and so so it's just been great. And and Michael's tip was pointing out that it's it's ag that Atmos is agnostic to the playback system. So if you tell it you're playing over stereo, it plays in stereo. If you tell it you're playing over quad, it plays in quad. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. since then, the quad setup's been per well permanent. You know, you yeah. see, they're just on mic stands. Yeah. But it's it's up all the time in my room now. Yeah. And at f when I first started doing quad and tr experimenting with Atmos. Because Logic's got Atmos built in now. My DAW yeah. of choice has got yeah. Atmos built in. Uh -huh. So I'd started experimenting doing Atmos over quad in Logic. But then I took the speakers down when I was finished. But now I realise I can just play anything. I've also bought a SACD player from the 90s, oh. which has got m discrete audio outs. Uh -huh. um, and I never really got into SACD because I thought it's just like posh CD, yeah. like 96K 24-bit, which yeah. I now love. I work in that as much as I can. But when it came out, I thought, oh, I'm not interested in that, really. It just seems like more expensive CDs. But it turns out SACD is a multi-channel format. Mm. So I got some 70s, what are they, DVDs, I suppose, Blu-rays, whatever they are. I've got some 70s discs. Mm. Now... No, they're not. They're modern discs, but they're from quadraphonic recordings in the seventies. Wow. That is really quadraphonic, oh, that I can really enjoy to listen to classical music and oh, wow. Mancini. I've got some Mancini. Really? Wow. Pink Floyd was mixed in quad in yeah. the seventies. Yeah. And and there it's real quad. The yeah. instruments are all round. A, a, another huge influence on on me for quadraphonic mm. is, is my friend Jamie, uh, who was is a wonderful. Uh, 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 engineer and producer Jamie Harley he was the live sound mixer for Jan Tiersen uh, last year I went on a, 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 a European tour I went five weeks on a nightliner bus mm. w with a project uh, a co-writing co-production project called Kankis with a young woman and we were the support band for Jan Tiersen so I met Jamie Harley who was the live sound guy and he kindly did our live sound his dad had a quadraphonic vinyl and jamie harley is a big quadraphonic nut as well he buys old vinyl mm -hmm. he's got like cartridges that decode quad and everything wow. so he was a big inspiration for me mm. and he also turned me on to the joys of quad so i've had lots of input and uh, it's very very esoteric mm like boutique little corner of the audio world but it is really really wonderful mm. and i'm evangelizing it obviously as you can tell and i'm mm. pushing so many of my friends to mm. to set up quad for themselves uh another uh, mm. friend of mine chris we've just started collaborating on a couple of projects he's from the university end of it there's a lot of universities you know they have like 32 speakers and stuff and that's all really awesome yeah, yeah. and and so if i ever get access to those systems i'm really excited to mm. explore eight speakers or 32 speakers mm. but the main the point for me is with quad i'm thinking and feeling in immersive from the very beginning mm -hmm. 
it's much easier to upscale it to big sound systems later, yeah, yeah. I feel, yeah. if I get the opportunity to. Yeah. You know, I'm not knocking the big multi-speaker systems. No, They're no. clearly amazing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But you can get so much immersive experience mm. just from quad, yeah. from four speakers, one in each corner, mm. or, or just in a little square around you, mm. that, that it's a no-brainer for me currently. Yeah. And even in some of the work that I'm doing that will mainly be heard in stereo, mm. I'm still trying to like produce it in quad. I just find it very inspirational. Mm. Yeah. It is, yeah. You know, immersive audio. And it's nice that, that, that my newfound enthusiasm for this is coming at a time when Dolby Atmos is moving into the mainstream because it's getting such a big push from Apple and Dolby. Yeah, yeah. That it means actually, mm -hmm. I can say to some clients, look, mm. I can encourage work with clients and friends in quad mm. because we we're that much closer to the atmos mix yeah you know if I've, we've got a great quad vibe going we can flip it to atmos mm. and and finish it with logic mm. in in atmos format monitoring in quad mm. and then maybe if we're lucky mm. we can get a day in a real atmos studio yeah. just to do the final tweaks yeah, the on the mix yeah. where we go oh, okay there we go mm. just needed to make a couple of adjustments you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But really, I'm doing it f because it's fun. A lot of people have got 5.1 systems. Yeah. And if you've got a Sonos 5.1 system, I yeah. think you can still stream Atmos to it. And it mm. still comes out from all around, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, it is difficult. My wife would not be pleased if I put quad in our living room. No, no. no it's no. only in the back bedroom that I'm, a, I, I'm able to, because it's my little Studio B, yeah. I've done quad. Yeah. You know, uh, and I can obviously do quad in here. Yeah. I can see the argument for the sound bar, because it doesn't yeah. fill up the living room. Yeah. But it's not, not the true the immersive it's audio. Same. It's yeah. not the true immersive audio, you know. Yeah. It's a really yeah. old format. Yeah. And, like, J Jamie Harley's the guy for this, because... Yeah. Because he's he's actually buying old, you can't buy quadraphonic vinyl now, but you no. can get old vinyl that exactly. was done in quadraphonic. Wow. There, there were two formats, yeah. and he can decode both of them. He's had his dad's old quad amp refurbished That's and amazing. working. That's amazing. It's amazing. And you get quad off records. Because we talked about streaming services. Briefly, yeah. And how everyone wants music or feels that music should be free. And... The the problem with that is of course um it takes time it takes a lot of time and effort to make music. And if you can't make money from making it it's gonna die. Or it's not gonna die, but it's gonna make it very, very hard for artists. Or will it encourage like derivative sort of the same kind of things coming through? Yeah, maybe. You know, in the way that in Hollywood they, they you, it has to be something that people can understand, you know. And it's always the good stuff. Yeah. It's always the stuff that never would have been. No. That yeah. that that yeah. fails the pitch, if you yeah. like, in the yeah. you know, in the yeah. way that no one signed the Beatles or something, you know. That's right. At, yeah. at the time. They wouldn't get signed today. <coughs> or, or whatever, or whatever, yeah. whatever you know. Yeah. I mean, it's very difficult. I feel, mm. I I I, it's both and. I was singing the praises of, you know, it's obviously incredible that you and I can make music and we can put it on Bandcamp or we can put it out on Spotify even yeah. and people all over the world can hear it. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm a, my own, most of my own music hardly makes me any money at all. Yeah. Uh, so I've got a day job and I'm very lucky I've got a day job in music as well and the two like feed back to each other mm -hmm. wonderfully. Mm -hmm. um, and actually as a musician you have a day job as a music yeah. educator yeah. you have a day job in music right. as well I'm actually a different a different yeah. aspect of music but nevertheless music. in music yeah. you know and i consider my i mean where i really feel for is is uh, and it's not just the young musicians i feel for any of the alternative weird up and coming musicians or very established musicians who make weird music that doesn't sell very much is very hard for them mm. if you're because the streaming model doesn't pay the artists anything no, you know no. so someone i mean i you know i'm not i'm not a computing or a business expert but someone at some stage decided that this mm industry was right for the picking mm. and in silicon valley they decided well actually we, we know what we're going to do a new model mm. we're going to make it so that the artists don't get paid hardly anything mm. and music is a lot cheaper for people and obviously i think everyone knows about it. it's been so widely discussed you know mm. 
music fans know, a lot of music fans will go to Bandcamp if they're interested in alternative yeah. music and they'll support it mm. in the same way you kindly offered to buy my vinyl. Yeah, you know, it's much well, appreciated. Yeah. And a lot of music fans understand that now. Mm. You know, I'm, I can be bitter. I try not to be bitter because it's not helpful. The genie's out of the bottle, right? It's never going back in the bottle. You know, Brian Eno's spoken about this quite a lot. Mm. Clearly the 70s and 80s was a boom time for the music industry and maybe mm. we were unfairly recompensed for our work maybe we did better than we should have done you know why should why should a musician get paid a lot more than a doctor or a nurse you know in some ways you can say that you know it's the it's it's the yeah. it's the team in a and e that you need if you, you know when your yeah, life's threatened sure. no, you need that yeah. you want to pay the team in a and e you don't want to pay the person who's pay, making the soundtrack no. you know but clearly art is incredibly valuable to us individually mm. it's in, in valuable to cultures you know oligarchs come to london because they like the arts scene they don't just come to london because they no. can get tax breaks no. they no. come because they like the mm. community of the galleries and the mm -hmm. the theaters and the music venues and the, and, vibe. And the vibe you know mm. clearly artists are a big part of the vibe of and we always have been for thousands of years mm. you know culture's hugely important and it does generate a lot of money, but not immediately, which is seems to me some why, why all these what they call them the uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, the science the science courses at uh, universities that are the ones that are now being funded. Right, yeah. the government is yeah. really keen on on. Um, you know, STEM. thank you, STEM brother. Subjects. STEM subjects. We're now getting STEAM, though, which puts R and A in the. Great. STEM well, let's let's, yeah. let's 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 yeah. let's 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 um, give all the support we can to STEAM. Well, I think I, I, Einstein said that um, there's a, there's an art to science and there's a science to art. Totally, and that's all so true. Mm. Obviously, who are we to argue with, Doctor yeah. Einstein? Yeah. But yeah, I totally agree, and I, to me, they're all part important part of the culture. A lot of young people finding it really challenging. <clears throat> back in the 70s and 80s mm. they could be a starting band they would have made enough basically not being successful selling a few records doing some gigs yeah. you know it's a double whammy for the young bands they can't go and play in Europe because it's illegal and too expensive for them mm. and they can't sell any records no. uh, uh, and so that's going to be hard down the line yeah. um, I guess what's going to happen is a lot more interesting alternative musicians are going to have day jobs mm. and there is a long history of painters and filmmakers and yeah, and musicians everyone has, there's a long history of people having day jobs you know yeah. that's for sure mm. and then maybe a luck at some stage some people will get a break and move through to the level where they can generate an income but it, it, you know it's shocking but the world changes and that's what it's like now and there is an upside for me but as you say, when things get algorithmically driven, the trouble with the algorithmic recommendations as well, I, I feel, from Spotify, mm. if you recommend music to me, yeah. we know each other a tiny bit, yeah. it's quite likely that you're going to recommend music to me that I've never heard of. Mm. Whereas the alg the, 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 also it might be stuff that is not usually what I would listen to. Uh, you know, we might yeah, have a sure. conversation That's right. and I might recommend something to you that mm. normally you'd, the algorithm's only going to recommend stuff to you that it thinks you're going to like. Oh, no. And you might recommend music to me mm -hmm. that you might say, well, actually, Gareth, mm, yeah, you, you yeah. might be worth pursuing. Yeah. The yeah. algorithm's never going to no, do that to no, me. No, which is, and that's why the record store was really good, a curated record store, because you might say, well, look, I really like Miles Davis and, yeah. and I really like, uh, I don't know, um, Herbie Hancock. And then the guy in the record store might say, have you, I don't know, have you heard, uh, no. he might say, well, have you heard uh, Pharrell Williams yeah. in in his early work or something? You know, yeah. some yeah. this kind of curated that human beings can give each other yeah. that the algorithms can't do yet. No. So, and you can get an instinct for it. <laughs> you can have an instinct, oh, Gareth might like yeah. it. Yeah, uh, because we're in the same room and we're having a chat. It, you know, it was, it, it's, it's, uh, so, so there's a downside to the algorithmic driven list. But of course, a lot of people... You know, don't use Spotify like that. A lot of people talk to their mates mm. and they say, well, oh, you can hear it there. And it is, it is a miracle that all that music's available out there. <coughs> but it's not that good it for is. the young musicians. But I think... As a music, I can't, 
underline enough how important it has been for me to listen to all kinds of different music yeah. through my life and be yeah. and more and more open as we started this conversation actually mm. there's there's music that connects with you and there's music that doesn't connect and mm. sometimes it doesn't connect on first listening no. which was another good thing about when we had to buy records yeah that's right uh, you know when we used to have to save up and buy a record mm. sometimes you'd buy a record and you wouldn't get it the first no, time no. but because you'd spent your money on it yeah and some your mate had said it was a good record. You might yeah. play it two or three or four five times. Yeah. And then you it's think, favorite. it's brilliant. It's your favourite And you one. didn't get it at all at first. And that mm. that's a fantastic experience as well. To just that, be that's open. when you buy an album. So you like an artist and you buy a single, the big hit single. There you go. And then you get the whole album and like track eight is like, what's that? Yeah. But then like you say... Right. Eventually, it becomes your. F yeah. Oh, I really like that. One. Yes, or even yeah. sometimes the whole artist happened like to me, thing, yeah. where an artist's been recommended. Oh, you've got to listen to this. I think. Oh, I've got to listen to that. Or my mates are saying it, yeah. or someone I respect has said that, mm. and I don't get it at all. But because I've spent my own money on it as a as a young person, you know, where the yeah. money was, where it really counted, okay. it's basically my spare cash had gone on the. But though, and that's that was a bonus too, yeah. and so it's really worth uh, being open. I've just uh, resubscribed. To the Wire magazine, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. which I have got so much great connections from, uh, you know, musically. Mm. I mean, obviously, it's loads of weird music in it, and some yeah. people say it's yeah. over intellectual and whatever. Mm. But there's basically they're very passionate about music, and it's very broad. Mm. And because it's the end of the year thing, it just got me again. Right. I thought I'll try another year of subscription. And already, just listening to their end of the year stuff, yeah. it's made me listen to music that I never otherwise would have listened to. And some of it's been amazing for me, really amazing. And I'm carrying, obviously, it's 50 records. I've got a long way to go to carry on exploring. But but I think it's really important to just be as broad, to, to broaden our listening horizons. Listen without prejudice. So thanks ever so much for everything. So um, your generosity of time and your kindness. Thanks for coming, Stace. Thank Very you nice for to chat. Me. Yeah. What um, What are you working on right now, then? Uh, well, like a lot of people in the business and in the arts, mm -hmm. I'm working on loads of different things because I have to to keep it all going. Yeah. You know, um, I have uh, my electronic music improvisation project, Sunroof. Uh -huh. Is we've finished our third record, and uh, we just need to sign off. We've done a little bit of editing. We just need to sign off on that uh -huh. uh, and then get that mastered. Mm -hmm. Whilst I've... Um, we, it's, it's, it's often recorded in on four channels, as I said, yeah. but it's a st essentially been... Up to now, it's been a stereo project. Uh -huh. But whilst I've been listening to the, the tracks that we've chosen to put out and listening to the final edits that we did together, yeah. I've started... Because I've been listening in here, I've started opening up to quad. Yeah. So I'm so we so I'm making quad versions of that as well. I'm very keen to get quad on Bandcamp, real quad, and I'm I'm going to deliver Atmos to the record company as well. Right. So that's uh, uh, Sunroof Electronic mm -hmm. Music Improvisations. That's a, like a co-written project of original music. It's very weird, experimental electronic music, very close to our hearts. We love it. Mm -hmm. Um. And I listened to that on YouTube. It's um, every, that, it's really nice quality. I can't believe how good quality it is, just improv improvisation. Yeah. It sounds like you've mixed it and, we, and you haven't, you've done it all live. We are, we, you know, a lot of, uh, it's very important. In, in improvisation, we're listening to the other person, right? Yeah. We're listening to the whole picture, yeah. which is just mm. as much the other person as it is you. Mm. And so we do that a lot. We're quite good at that now after all these years. Right. We, we listen to each other a lot. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we try... We have a good result with that, actually, when we play live. Yeah. Because there's no predetermined thing, because live is an improvisation, mm. we kind of mix into the sound system. Uh -huh. So usually it yeah. sounds pretty good live. Oh, I see. Yeah. <clears throat> right. Do you see what I mean? I do, yeah. Because yeah. it's not like there's some no. idea of what it's supposed to sound like. No. You know, if the bass isn't that loud, mm -hmm. we just turn it up a bit, the bass kind mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. So that works really well. Um, and do you, do you record it with mics on speakers? or does No, it it's all DI. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so far, you know, okay, yeah. I'm interested. We, it's it's an interesting possibility, mm. but right now it's 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 all DI, in like seventies electronic music straight out the synthesizers. Mm. Obviously, there's tons of effects, but you know, 
So that's that. Uh, mm -hmm. I've got my, you mentioned, I kindly mentioned my solo project, Electrogenetic. Have you got a second one? I've got a second out? album. Oh, right. I've been struggling with a difficult second album, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I've just had a bit of a hope. I touch wood. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've got had a little bit of a conceptual breakthrough because I've got some really interesting pieces. Yeah. I've started opening them up into quad, and that's made me see them in a very different way and be very ruthless about editing them and I've been through several ones recently where I've thought well it's just way too long <laughs> throw that bit away oh that's a bit cheesy why is that sounding a bit cheesy pop just don't use those bits use the weird bits or whatever right, yeah and and it's become partly because I've just opened the mixes up in here mm -hmm. into quad and heard it in a different way so I think I'm getting close to finishing a second record Brilliant. which uh, there's no Re record label for that it's just that's just our own thing might probably put it out on our own label somewhere mm -hmm. um so that's personally really great um i'm working on a couple of uh, commissioned projects i've i've met uh, a bunch of musicians uh, who originally i think uh, from mexico uh, a couple of them live in the in, uh, united states of america now and those are very beautiful songs uh, and two two girl singers and one guy uh, synthesist and keyboard player I suppose and they've struggled to finish their songs but we've we we've, we've uh, got, um, had a like a meeting of souls and minds mm -hmm. where they send me kind of quite simple raw demos mm -hmm. with wonderful singing on it and lovely chords and I and I uh, do my thing on it with weird uh, modulars and so on, mm -hmm. and so that's a project called Electro Drain. We don't know where that's going, but that's quite involving at the moment. It's really, really uh, fun to work on. We're getting some great results. I'll, I'll play you a track before okay. you go, um, and um, uh, that's so. That's another project. Uh, I, I'm always m uh, meeting new people and. Uh, and uh, and I'm open to new projects. I've just met a woman in New York where I might uh, collaborate with her on finishing her new record. She's called Night Night. This project of mine, Kankees, which is also on, on Mute Records, mm -hmm. the one where I went on tour on the Nightliner bus, we've started co-writing a, a second record. Uh, and we've got a couple of beautiful songs that we've done already. I have this long, ongoing project with my friend Nick Hook uh -huh. from Brooklyn, Spiritual Friendship, yeah. that you mentioned you listen to some of the drone music. The Chakra. <clears throat> We've done... We did our first record, mm. and then we thought, oh, that's interesting, that was an interesting record. Um, we wanted to make some more records, um, and we thought the first record basically is comprised of field recordings drones yeah. beats yeah. drums if you like yeah. and if you like sequences uh -huh. Uh -huh. so we said okay we had we got a concept because i'm quite good on manifestos and concepts because it helps me get shit done yeah so we had a concept we said okay the next four records will be one will be only drones uh -huh. one will be only drums one will be only sequ only sequences if you like founded in sequences uh -huh. and one will be built from field recordings so we did the drones record that you heard it, yeah. we did the drums record okay that's rec a lot of it's recorded onto porter studio only drum machines is that on soundcloud as well it's on, it's on spotify it's everywhere it? yeah it, right. it's on because we released that on cassette okay um and we did the sequences record and now we're working on the we just it's been a while we've both been busy we we've always been in the same room before when we've started working but at the moment, Nick, Nick's in Brooklyn and uh, Colombia, in mm. South America. Mm. Um, and so we, we're starting to work on the field recordings record. Right. And we've, we've unusually, we've decided, well, we, we like to do things differently every time. Uh -huh. One thing we haven't done is re work remotely. Sure. So we're going to try uh -huh. starting the field recordings record remotely by swapping field recordings and maybe... I'll do a little sketch and send it to Nick mm. with something, and, and so we're going to see if that works. Mm. So we've got the Spiritual Friendship fifth record, that'll be, I think, that's very important to us creatively. It kick-started mm. our mutual creativities. I've got uh, 
another wonderful project with my friend Chris Bono in the cat he lives in New York State in the Catskill Mountains and we've done a couple of records uh, uh, under the name of Naus Alpha and we have prod uh, uh, a strong concept for a fourth a third album which is also going to be quadraphonic we started talking about that a year ago we wanted to start work on it this year we've missed the window of opportunity mm. but it's not going to go away no. but even at the start of this year we were talking about making it for a performance space in immersive audio in quad mm. he's got a wonderful big barn mm. the where we can set up to work on composing from the beginning in quad again and that we're going to can do you that can perform it there as well we could put his barn is kind of in his private home, okay. so I don't think he oh, wants... No. I suggested to him we do performances there, but he doesn't really want no, to. Fair enough, yeah. But we could probably set up in another space, somewhere in mm. in its w outside uh, Woodstock, so it's quite a hippie-ish kind of area, oh, wow. so we might find a nice little space where we could perform in quad. But uh, anyway, so, so they've got all these different uh, projects going on right now and looking forward to exploring them further. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stace. Really Thanks for coming. It. It's really nice to chat with you. Thank you so much for listening to our podcast. If you found it enjoyable or interesting, please like and subscribe and even leave a comment down below if you like. <laughs>